Thank you, Scott, for that wonderful prelude. Well, welcome to Christmas Eve services here at Dewajak's First United Methodist Church. It's so good to see all of you out there. Um, we don't really have many announcements this morning. However, I understand that Barbara Groner and Sharon Harnden have something that they want to say to you. I would like to take this opportunity as the chair of the SPRC committee to share with our pastor the love and gratitude that your congregation has for you with a Christmas gift. So Jody, a hug and a card. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for all you do with your spiritual leadership for our group. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can we please have Linda and Scott come up, please? Yeah, Scott. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> I think most of you know that I'm usually not at a loss for words, but right now I am. These two have been such a blessing to the choir. Linda, we can't do this without you, that is for sure. And this is the choir's way of saying thank you and very, very Merry Christmas. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Scott, I'll tell you, if any of you would like to sing in the choir sometime, please come and join us. Scott makes this so much fun. And all we want to do is please him. We want to please the Lord, too, but we want to make Scott happy. And when we get done on a Sunday morning, you can tell whether it's been good or bad. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, we'd also like to say thank you from the choir and a very, very Merry Christmas to you and your family. Well, now let's go ahead and I'll take a moment to um, greet those around us in the name of Christ.
Would you please join me in a call to worship? The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. God's salvation is at hand. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. Our opening hymn is It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. It's up on the screen or in the Pew Bible on page 218. And now we will light our Advent and Christ candles. I'd like to invite Harvey Ross and Jared Peters to come forward. God, you have shined your light upon your people, the light of peace, justice, and righteousness. We listen to the story of Mary and Joseph, shepherds and angels, and join in celebrating the arrival of Jesus Christ into the world. Welcome the arrival of Christ child, son of God, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. On this Christmas Eve, we light this Christ candle, acknowledging light has come into the darkness, and the darkness will no, not overcome it.
And now as we prepare to hear of the... Let's try that again. Now as we prepare to hear the word of the Lord, let us listen as the choir sings.
Our first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 2 through 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood, will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Our gospel reading on this Christmas Eve comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. I'd invite you to rise as you're able in honor of the reading of the gospel. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinus was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angel had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they'd been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they'd heard and seen, which were just as they'd been told. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So tonight's the night. This is the one we've been waiting for, and we finally have arrived as we've journeyed from the beginning of Advent through those four weeks all the way to today, to the night that we get to celebrate the birth of Jesus You know, I can remember waiting for this day to arrive when I was a child. I think I was probably more focused on the gifts than anything else. 
But, you know, also, it was an exciting time. You know, either we would go visit relatives or we'd have relatives come visit us. And, you know, the visiting of families is a big part of Christmas, I think, for many of us. Um, when we have gifts, when we have guests come to visit, you know, sometimes we will have a special guest room that's set aside for them. But, you know, what happens if we have many people come visit? You know, then maybe we have the guest room and then we put someone else on the pull-out couch. So, you know, what happens if even more people come? Well, then maybe we pull out the arrow bed and we set it up in another corner and we've got a couple more people sleeping on it. But the thing is, it's like we always have room. We always will make room for people. As we're gathered here tonight, I'd kind of like us to step away from the hustle and the bustle of this season, though. Um, what this holiday, what this season has become over the past century seems to be filled with commercialism, with presence, with overindulgence, and along with it, a healthy heaping sometimes for people of feelings of guilt, feelings of inadequacy. And it makes it real hard to remember why it is that we're celebrating Christmas. It makes it real easy to lose sight of the fact that we're celebrating the birth of the Savior of the world. We're celebrating the night that God came into the world to live among us. Now, according to our scripture reading today, the powers of Rome had called for a census that required Joseph and Mary to travel to Bethlehem, even though Mary was in her last month or so of pregnancy, ready to give birth. Now, the Romans called the census for the purpose of taxing the people. And, you know, because there were so many people that had returned to their hometowns, space was kind of tight. Now, in the common version of the story that has become the Christmas Eve tradition, Mary and Joseph can't find a place to stay because there's no room in the inn. So they end up staying in some random stable with the animals. And it's here that Mary gives birth to Jesus. But, you know, another interpretation of the Greek word that's used for inn is also guest room. So if Mary and Joseph are returning to Joseph's hometown, he most likely has relatives in Bethlehem. And given Middle Eastern traditions of hospitality, it would have been unthinkable to let your visitors go back into the street. You always found a place to keep your family, to keep your visitors, to keep travelers. So if other people had already claimed the guest room, you know, the host family would still find a place to put up all of these traveling relatives. You know, so in a sense, it's kind of like Mary and Joseph ended up with the arrow bed. We think of the place that the animals kept, are kept, you know, like a stable, as an outbuilding away from the house. But in ancient Palestine, people often had an area of their houses where they would bring the animals in for the evening. So, you know, maybe this was the only place left for them to fit visitors in, was this place where they kept the animals. Or maybe because Mary was in labor and about to give birth, this was the logical place for her to be, perhaps surrounded with all the other women in the household who were by her side lending her their experience and their support. And this is where the story starts to get messy, literally. You know, scholars will often talk about the scandal of the incarnation, the idea that God coming to live among us, not only as a lowly Palestinian peasant and the child of an unmarried teenage girl is somewhat unthinkable, but also because just the shocking, physical, common way that God chose to come into the world. You know, God decided to enter into this with all of us 
in the same messy, dangerous, painful, inconvenient way that all the rest of us have come into this world. You know, he came in in the manner of a common person as opposed to that of the grandeur and the comfort that we might expect great people to be born into. But maybe we can also think about Jesus coming into this world, into the love and to the nurture of an earthly family, like so many of us do. But we know that this, we all know that this is not a common birth story. I mean, this was an event so great that the angels appear to the shepherds in the field, praising God and sharing this good news of this holy birth. Not unlike the way the Roman emperor's birthday might be publicly declared each year. And both declarations, both proclamations designed to let the people know that a new year was coming, or in the instance of, of Jesus' birth, a whole new way of life was coming about. And, you know, throughout the story of the Bible, and especially through the story of Jesus' life and ministry, we see this juxtaposition of earthly royalty and earthly power in opposition to the reign of God and what the reign of God is like. We see how the story is constantly turned upside down so that what we expect as people of the world to be the best thing and the right thing is oftentimes surprisingly subverted by what it is that God wants for us, how it is that God intends for our world to be, how it is that he intends us to live into this world. So the story tonight that we cherish repeating each year is, is one that holds a special place, I think, in all of our hearts, a special place for all of us. So while we stay here just a little bit longer, before we leave here and lose ourselves back into the gift-giving and the sugar-fueled frenzy of what our modern-day Christmas has become, Let's spend a little bit more time together thinking about what the real Christmas was all about, what the real gift of Christmas is, that gift of the hope that we have in God's promises of love and grace, God's promises that are fulfilled through the life and the ministry of Jesus. So let's take a few more minutes here as we share Holy Communion and as we sing about that silent night to remember these promises of love and grace. May it be so. Amen. And now I'd ask you to stand and sing Hark the Herald Angel Sings. It's number 240 in your hymnal. The words will also be on the screen.
Please be seated. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to you on this Christmas Eve night, grateful of the gift that you've given us, the gift of your son, Jesus. God, we ask that as we celebrate this day, as we celebrate the coming of the light into the world, we also remember that as followers of Christ, it is up to us to, to, to spread this good news that we've been given and to live our lives in ways that help the world to be at peace, to help the world to be as one, to help the world to know of the importance of this gift that God has given to us. God, we are grateful for all that we have. And we know that all that we have comes from you. And we pray these names, these things, in the name of your precious son. And we pray the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we have a time to return to God, a portion of the gifts we have received. The ushers may come forward.
God, as we gather this evening, all our attention is focused on a baby lying in a makeshift bed in an it-will-have-to-do stable. It's not lost on us that you sent your son, our Savior, into the world among the poorest of the poor and told us. This will be a sign to you. As we present gifts to you, we pray that they might reach those in the greatest need, that they might lift those in the deepest despair, and that they might bring peace and compassion to those who find themselves amidst conflict. We pray this in the name of that holy child, Jesus the Christ, and our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Will those who've offered to help serve communion please come forward? Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in love and peace with each other. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. In the fullness of time, you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. And at his birth, the angels sang, Glory to you in the highest, and peace to your people on earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. As Mary and Joseph went from Galilee to Bethlehem, and there found no room, so Jesus went from Galilee to Jerusalem and was despised and rejected. As in the poverty of a stable Jesus was born, so by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. As your word became flesh born of woman on that night long ago, so on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, and he gave thanks to you, and then he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and gave it to his disciples. And he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and a living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here 
and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by your blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast his, his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ, poured out for you. Here at Dwajak's First United Methodist Church, we have an open communion table. That means all who are here are welcome to come and take part in communion, whether they're a member of this church or any other church. We'll be serving communion by intinction, which means that as the ushers dismiss your row, you'll come forward, you'll receive a piece of bread, and then you can dip it into the grape juice. Um, if you are unable to eat gluten, we have gluten-free bread set aside in the station in the middle and individual cups of juice as well because we, again, want everybody to be able to partake. So as, after you finish taking communion, you can either stop and pray at the kneeling rails um, or as you return to your seat, we ask you tonight to please take a candle with you so that you'll have the light of Christ with you as we sing Silent Night. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come and be fed.
for what we've just received. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you've given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, as we continue our celebration of the birth of Christ, let's sing together that special song we sing every Christmas Eve, Silent Night.
and now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face to shine upon you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.